Hello and welcome to another edition of the Paranormal Concept Show. I'm your host, Paul Rook, and we are exclusive on the PAUK Radio Network. As always, we are joined by Kerry Greenaway. Hello, Kerry. Hello. Hello, how are you? I'm very well, thank you. Good, good. And we, we've got Stranger in the studio tonight. Richard <laughs> Clements, is it? I got lost on the way in, but I'm here. I'm finally yeah, here. Yeah, well, you've been changed the locks, Richard. I, uh, I know. <laughs> I had to get the locksmith to help me to get me back into my own studio. <laughs> but how are you anyway? Because we've not I'm, heard from you for. Like, yeah, no. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm really well, thanks. Thanks good. for asking. And I'm just looking around the studio. You've done a good job. It's nice and tidy. So well, yeah, we got the maid in. <laughs> specifically just for you it's the female oh, right. touch is all i'm saying <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> no thanks guys no we we even got one of those ones that don't wear all their clothes when they do not oh, just... oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> you should have phoned me up I, and i would have come in for that regardless well we thought we'd be early <laughs> right well now they've lowered the tone i'm going to raise it again <laughs> <laughs> We've got a great guest tonight for the Paranormal Concept Show. He is a cryptozoologist, an author, a zoological journalist, a lecturer, an explorer, absolutely fascinating character all round. He is Mr. Richard Freeman. Good evening, Richard. How are you? I'm fine. How's yourself? We're all very well, thank you. Well, we wanted to do a show on cryptozoology, but to be fair, that's not really one of our areas of expertise. So we thought we'd get an expert in to talk to us all about this kind of subject. So how did you first get into this subject in the, in the initially? Well, I can answer that in three words for you. Classic Doctor Who. Oh, he said oh dear, he said the fatal words of Doctor Who. Well, on, <laughs> off you go. Yep. Fantastic. Another Hoovian. <laughs> I, was, uh, I, I grew up in the 70s. I'm a child of the 70s. And uh, I grew up with uh, John Pertwee, who was always my favourite doctor. Yeah. And, um, because he had been incarcerated on Earth by the time Lord, all the monsters he fought were on your doorstep. So you had giant maggots crawling out of slag heaps in Wales, intelligent marine dinosaurs that have awakened from millions of years of hibernation. You've got Lovecraftian tentacled aliens that project their uh, their minds and their life essence into into um, plastic so that children's toys and dummies can turn into killers. And then after that, you had Tom Baker, who was very good as well. And you've got giant rats in, in the sewers of London gnawing people's legs off and, and wonderful things like that. But the Doctor Who was as much about horror as it was about science fiction. And I always emphasise classic Doctor Who. I like the real Doctor Who, not the gender flip, woke, politically correct excrement that the BBC are vomiting up at the minute, which disgusts and enrages me, and uh, made me uh, stop paying my licence fee. But the the idea of monsters was seeded by Doctor Who, and uh, I still love the classic episodes. And of course I watch things like um, The World About Us and Life on Earth with David Attenborough, who's another one of my heroes, so I was interested in both natural history and monsters from a very early age. When I left school, I decided I was going to become a zookeeper. And throughout my life, people have said to me, oh, you can't do that, you won't be able to do that. And people said, oh, you won't be able to become a zookeeper. So I went out and became a zookeeper. I worked at Twycross Zoo in the West Midlands, where the PG t- chimps come from, and um, ended up running a reptile house there. And then... Um, Years later, I happened on a, a little magazine called Animals and Men, which wasn't as rude as it sounded. It was uh, on sale in the sadly now defunct Potter's Museum of Curiosities at the Jamaica Inn, which was this wonderful collection um, of heterogeneous things by uh, uh, a Victorian eccentric Walter Potter. So you could see a head of a man-eating crocodile from India next to a Maori axe, next to a, uh, uh, a pair of stuffed squirrels who were having a duel. Um, <laughs> it was wonderful. It was wonderful. Sadly, all broken up and, and cast to the four winds now. Uh, the only place like it is uh, Victor Wynne's Little Shop of Horrors in London, which has a very similar, similar vibe about it. But it was a wonderful 14 collection of bizarre items. And in the little shop, this magazine, Animals and Men, was on sale. I brought it, read it, enjoyed it, started writing to the editor, 
I became a Yorkshire rep because at the time I was studying zoology up at uh, Leeds University as a mature student. And they said, like, you know, when you're done up at Leeds, come down and uh, move down to Devon and become our zoological director. So I did. And this organisation, the Centre for Fortean Zoology, or CFZ for short, and it's the only uh, organisation of its kind in the world. And we travel around the world searching for mysterious creatures, um, cryptids, animals that are thought to be extinct but might still be around. And, and we write books and magazines about it. We, we have made the odd documentary. And, you know, after joining up with the CFZ, I've, for the past, oh, 20 years or more, I've, um, I've been all over the world looking for strange creatures such as the Mongolian death worm, the Tasmanian wolf, the giant anaconda, the yeti, the almasti, the minkinanka, you name it. So your work with the CFZ, uh, is, is that actually like a, a zoo in its own right? No, 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 the CFZ is not a zoo. Um, or some people might describe it as a zoo. <laughs> Got some strange animals in it, <laughs> but um, there's a small collection of exotic animals, a very small collection of main, mainly things in tanks, um, reptiles, amphibians, and fish. But it's not like a zoo. Its headquarters is a, 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 a an old farmhouse up in North Devon, and that's where we uh, we publish our books and our journal from. So that's the nexus of it. But. Um, from there, we go out all over the world uh, hunting monsters. Because there's so many different um, types of cryptozoology creatures, um, what uh, what makes you decide which one you're going to go and look for? Well, that's, that's a good question, and there are a number of criteria. You've got to look at how likely it is that this creature exists. Is it uh, as it's been consistently reported for a long period of time. Is it an animal that was once known to have uh, existed but is now thought to be extinct but may still be around? Um, how likely is it? Then you've got to look at uh, how accessible is the area, particularly in financial terms, how much would it cost to get there? Um, and those, those are the two main things you look into. Uh, and also, are, are, there, are the sightings recent? I mean, you don't want to go looking for something that was last seen uh, 200 years ago. Maybe. So, for example, uh, I wouldn't waste my money going looking for the Chupacabra because I believe it's a construction of the media. I don't think there's any such an animal as the Chupacabra. Uh, whereas something like the Tasmanian wolf, which I've looked at, uh, looked at uh, uh, searched for um, on several occasions, we know that it existed up until the 1930s, and there's a good chance it's still around today. So that's that's how you make your decision. Okay. How do you fund that? Because it must be an expensive hobby. I bet it's not, it can't just be a hobby. No, no, no. no we fund it mainly for our own pockets. We get a, a bunch of people together, and we try and keep the numbers quite small. We get some people together that all want to go on this expedition, and we all chip in for the fund. Now, on occasion, it is very rare, it's happened a couple of times, um, about three times now, we have had television companies who want to make documentaries pay for pay for the expedition and they send um, a couple of people along to film it. The last time that what happened was 2013, when I went for the fifth time to the island of Sumatra in Indonesia in search of the Orang Pendek, which is a an upright walking ground dwelling ape that's unknown to science that is supposed to live in the jungles of Sumatra. Quite distinct from the orangutan that lives on the, on the forest floor. But uh, that, that's very rare. That's very rare. I'm hoping, fingers crossed, to get out to Mongolia for another crack at the death. So, so obviously some of these places, you know, sort of like, uh, I can understand you sort of go to Australia, Tasmania to look for the uh, fire scene and stuff. But when you sort of talk about going to places like uh, Sumatra and uh, Mongolia, is it, are these places difficult to get into? I mean, do you, you know, because they're not sort of the most accessible places and sort of like the governments of the 
countries, you know, you might and you may think, well, and how do they actually? Do you have? And, and is there a big process of getting visas and stuff to actually go and do it? It depends on where you're going. Um, Sumatra, what which is in Indonesia, they never used to have visas, but now they they want visas. But there's a there are sites you can go on that sort out your visas for you. You can type in where you want to go, and they'll give you the information. You go from there, so that's not not so difficult. Um, getting into some Mongolia and Sumatra will fine. Um, the key to it is is finding um, good local guides that know the area. Um, I can do groundwork for you so they can find witnesses, find out where the most recent sightings were and practical things like um, uh, sorting out uh, porters and tents and transport and stuff. For instance, when we were in Mongolia, we went with a company called eMongol.com and we sent them some posters written in Mongolia uh, for them to distribute to all the little um, villages and things. Uh, excuse me, I'm going to sneeze. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Oh, bless my cotton socks on in the news. All all the um, they have little villages of or or of girls, which are the circular uh, little tents they have. And in Mongolia they have what they call sums. In, instead of counties they call them sums, but a sum can be, you know, the size of a small country. And there is a sum centre, which is the largest connotation within that sum. And they sent them out to a number of these places before we, you know, months before we went, saying there'll be a group of English scientists coming through in at this particular time. Uh, if anybody knows anything about the death worm or has seen one, we'd want to talk to them. And that really paid dividends. We got lots of witnesses um, that way. So usually it's not hard to get into. I mean, the, the last time I was in Russia, uh, we had some trouble uh, because... We had uh, arranged our visas through uh, a place that deals with uh, Russian visas in uh, London. And they had our, our visas expiring on the day we were due to fly back. And we said, won't this be a problem? And they had said, no, you'll be in transit. It won't be a problem. But the Russian authorities didn't think that. The Russian authorities basically arrested us and kept us in the airport for another day. And then we had to get, we had to pay for flights back, and were fined five hundred pounds each. Yeah, so I could imagine that. Um, what sort of reaction do you get when you sort of turn up at places and you're going through airports, and they usually say, "And what's the purpose of your travel?" And you sort of, do you sort of tell them straight up um, um, what you're there to do? We just usually say tourism, just to. So nobody will ask questions. Right, so you don't get any raised eyebrows or anything like that. Yeah. So this must take quite some planning because I'd imagine that a lot of the places you go to are like really off off the beaten track, as it were, to try and track down these animals. Um, so that must mean you have to like be in touch with like the, a lot of locals. How do you go about that process? Because that must be quite difficult in some of the remote areas. Well, in, um, in Sumatra, we got great guys. We had a guy called um, Sahar Dimas, who sadly passed away now. He was a tiger shaman for his tribe. They venerate the tiger, and he was a tiger shaman. And he, he used to take us into the jungle. But we got our Sumatran guides through um, a, a, a woman called Debbie Marta, who was a... Uh, a travel writer who ended up staying in Sumatra and she's lived there ever since and she became the head of the Indonesian Tiger Conservation Group and she'd seen the Orang Pendek four times herself and she put us in touch with these uh, these guides. Uh, in Mongolia we got it through the, the website emongol.com uh, In Russia we contacted a Ukrainian guy called Grigory Panchenko uh, who had seen the, the Almasty, the Russian wild man, and uh, he's, a, he's a biologist. And he, he'd seen this creature quite close up, and we, we got him over uh, to Britain to speak at one of our conventions, and then we just arranged with him to have a team up between Russian, Ukrainian, and, and British scientists to go on the trail of the, uh, the Almasty, the wild man, 
uh, of the Caucasus. And in the former USSR, they, they took it so seriously that they had actually had a commission to look for the creature. And uh, although it was um, disbanded eventually, it's, uh, the new Snowman Commission a few years ago has been uh, instigated. So uh, there are certain sort of governments and stuff you've come across when you do venture out that do actually take this quite seriously then? Well, the Russian government took it very seriously indeed. When we were in South America looking for the giant anaconda, our guide was a guy called Damon Corey, and he turned out to be uh, the hereditary chief of the Eagle Clan Arawak tribe, so he's a very well-respected uh, well respected man. He's uh, um, uh, an Indian chief, and uh, he took us out into the, the grasslands of South America looking for giant anacondas. Unfortunately, at the time, I experienced the worst drought in living memory. <laughs> that, that, the whole thing was sheer hell. That was the toughest expedition I've ever been, been on, because we weren't in the jungle where it was shady, we were out on the grasslands where it was murderously hot. No shade. It was so hot, the, the anacondas were all estimating. They, they weren't coming out, they were they were in a sort of semi-hibernation, and we were ripped apart by insects, um, smashed down by heat stroke and thirst and exhaustion, and the whole thing is a bloody nightmare. There exists <laughs> a photograph somewhere taken by my ex-girlfriend of my arse, and it had been bitten to bits <laughs> by stories, and it looks like a giant bloated albino mutant strawberry grown cellophane. Oh, bless her. <laughs> so... We, we get covered in mosquitoes in the jungle, covered in ticks in the desert. I've been stalked by a tiger, attacked by a cobra. Uh, I fell off a, a cliff and was left hanging to some tree roots like Indiana Jones. I've nearly been swept away by rapids. Uh, I've fallen through what I thought was solid no, it wasn't, uh, um, and nearly slipped off a 500-foot cliff. What else? All sorts of things. This sounds horrendous. <laughs> it's all in a day's work. Yeah. The, last time, the last expedition I was on, which was a couple of years ago to Tajikistan, I, I, we all got violent, explosive volcanic dysentery that lasted for five weeks. Oh, my God. <laughs> Plenty yeah. of fluids on that screen. I think they, Oh, 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 the CF said they just do this because they want expensive foreign holidays. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds very extreme, um, <laughs> incredibly extreme. Um, have you actually found any of these animals that you've gone looking for? Well, with your rank pen deck, my colleague uh, Dave Archer and our guide Sir Hardiner saw it, um, they collected hair. Now, this hair was taken back by us and examined by an expert in mammal hair, um, Lars Thomas from the University of Copenhagen. And he said that it came from a primate that was related to but distinct from the Sumatran orangutan. And he's forced to conclude that there is a large unknown primate in Sumatra. And I've seen the orang appendix footprints, I've seen its handprints, I've heard it calling. So I've no doubt that the creature exists. Okay, so let's talk about the orang pendak to start with, because this is, um, like you say, it, it's quite a large creature, isn't it? It's not a little one. It, it's about three, three and a half to five feet tall. It's about the size of a chimpanzee, but it walks erect. It's very, very broad and muscular as well. So lay out Sumatran jungle for me. Is it? Is it... I don't know, how, how dense is it? I, I can't... It's very difficult for... Is well, it, I'm, I'm a homegrown UK girl that likes to stay in the UK. So can, can we outline this a little bit for me? It can get very dense in places. In some places, it's as dense as a Tory voter. <laughs> but it's... Uh, you get the lowland jungle, which is hot. But where we concentrate, uh, up in the mountains, it's cloud forest. So, um, as well as palm trees and stuff, you get like weird tropical pines in these cooler regions, and you get uh, a lot of um, 
a lot of lichen in the trees, hanging from the trees like cobwebs as well. And it gets bitterly cold at night. It's always damp, and at night it gets terribly cold, so we have to build a big fire in the campsite. So it's not like in Sumatra where we were, it's not like the jungle you might see from a Tarzan film. Mm. There's blistering patterns. It, 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 there are palm trees and, and tropical plants all over the place. This is a much cooler jungle uh, because it's high up in the mountains and uh, it gets very, very cold at night. I take it it's a massive expanse of, of uh, rainforest, effectively. Um, yeah, it's bigger than Wales, the place. So it's a bit like searching for a needle in a haystack. Yeah, we go to a place called uh, Karinchi Sablak National Park and most of our, our trips have been around the caldera of an extinct volcano um, called Gunung Kuju, the Lake of Seven Peaks, which is now filled with water. And we have to go across it on these decrepit old canoes that have been there ever since I've been going to Sumatra, and they look like they came off the Ark. It was the first <laughs> time I saw them. <laughs> well, uh, recently, and then we, we make a little camp, and then we do excursions out into the jungle and we just crept through the jungle every day. Set, we set up camera traps and stuff, look for tracks, look for hair. Is, so, is, there, any, is there any physical evidence that this um, creature exists or is it just a case of um, some of the locals have claimed to see it? Well, it's not just locals. Westerners have seen it as well, including this woman, Debbie Martha, who is the head of the t- uh, Tiger Conservation Group. And... Um, uh, Jeremy Holden, who's a wildlife photographer, has seen one of them as well. And we have the hair, which has been identified as being from an unknown primate, and we have the footprints and handprints. Okay. Is it, uh, because Sumatra is very famous for its orangutans, uh, would this possibly be a sort of related to the orangutan? Well, I think it is the <coughs> four species of orangutan, because... The island of Sumatra and the neighbouring islands of Java and Borneo were once all part of one landmass with the Malayan Peninsula. Um, when the water levels were lower, it was all one landmass, and it was called Sundaland, not to be confused with Sundal in Newcastle. <laughs> it was just one great big area. And over 400,000 years ago, we know that orangutans had already speciated into lots of, of different species. We had the Sumatran orangutan. This is before the, the island of Sumatra broke off. We had the, the sort of more gracile Sumatran orangutan. Then the uh, slightly fatter, bulkier uh, Bornean orangutan. Up in mainland China, we had a, a, a huge orangutan the size of a gorilla. And then we had that Gigantopithecus, which is only known from its teeth and jawbones which may have been part of the orangutan group, which was enormous. It may have been 10 feet tall, and it may have been the sister of the Yeti. So these are are all broken into different species before the the, um, oceans rose and cut off the island, cut the populations off. So there are already all these different types of orangutan. And as recently as 2017, new species of orangutan was found on Sumatra, the Tapanuli orangutan, which nobody knew was a new species of orangutan. And it's a whole, a huge ape, undiscovered by science living on Sumatra. So I think that the orangutan deck is another type of orangutan, but one that is adapted to life on the forest floor in uh, a very high elevation and cold climate. Uh, my friend Dave Archer, who saw it, said... The, the fur on it reminded him, reminded him of the fur on a mountain gorilla. That, that's a thick, shaggy fur, which is an adaptation to cold environments. Mm. And his face was strikingly human-like when he saw it. The the population of of the orang pendek can't be huge then. No, it wouldn't be huge, but it is. It, it's in a, in a very a uh, remote place, like I said before, this national park is the size of a small country, it's like the size of Wales, mm. and it's mostly thick forest, thick, dense forest. So, you know, there are probably 
a few hundred last thing I would have thought. Okay. Could it not just be a, um, a ginger cousin of the Bigfoot? Well, it's, it's not ginger for a start. Most people say that it's black or grey when they see it. Okay. Is it as, as it's bipedal, that, that is probably one of its sort of pecu- and, uh, pecu- peculiarities? Sorry. Um, is it intelligent, do you know? Uh, uh, does it sort of show sort of uh, b- b- a more intelligence than your standard sort of ape? More like show intelligence. Mm-hmm. More like the tool users. So it would be fairly intelligent. Right. When you heard its call, because you, you mentioned that you'd heard it, yeah. with your background, I, I assume that it was very distinctively different from anything else you'd recognise. Yeah, yeah, it was. Um, I've worked with all the great tapes, all the known great tapes, and all, its call is different, uh, and its footprint is, is, is different. When you see orangutan's footprint, they're very long and thin. This had um, a wide heel, like a human heel, which would be weight bearing. Then four toes at the front of the foot and an offset big toe. So it was obviously simian, but it was built for walking the wreck and built for being on the ground. The handprint was very different from an orangutan's handprint. Uh, an orangutan has a very small thumb and great long fingers. So it was very distinct handprint. The handprint of the orang pendek is more like a gorilla's handprint with thick, sausage-like fingers and a larger thumb. How excited do you get when you find things like this, when you find <laughs> traces like this? I mean, you must be oh, trekking for good. days. Yeah, and when you hear it calling, the last time I was there, I heard it calling, and it, it was less than a mile away in the jungle when I heard it calling. Yeah, it's real sort of uh, adventure stuff, isn't it, Kerry? I mean, it you can certainly just... is. I would imagine, that knowing that it's less than a mile away, the temptation to grab your stuff and just go here and off towards the sound would have been just the temptation to do well, that. We did. we did go towards the sound, but by the time we got there, it had gone. Yeah. So was it, is it more of a night creature than a day creature? No, no, it's, it's a day creature. It's a day creature. Are they solitary animals, or do or do they sort of move around in, in groups, they're like, say, uh, chimpanzees? No, they're solitary. Orangutans are solitary as well. They come together only to mate, or if there's a big food source, they'll gather together, but they don't move in troops like gorillas or um, chimpanzees. Oh, right. Well, it is like... even harder to track down, isn't it? Because, you know, you're not looking for a group, you're looking for a singularity. It's like... I just can't get my head around the fact that it's so remote that if something happened to any member of your group, you can't just call the emergency services. You probably haven't even got cell phone signals, have you, or anything, <laughs> you know? Uh, you, you, you can't really get um, mobile phone signals. When you, on occasion, we've taken a satellite phone. Mm. But if someone, something happened to somebody around Gun and Tuju, you'd have to cast them onto... Uh, uh, one of these old battered canoes, take them across the lake, get down the side of the volcano to the village, and then get them in a, a car to the nearest hospital. And God knows what an Indonesian hospital is going to be like. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> my goodness me. So, so before you set out on one of your excursions, uh, your your expeditions, I mean, you must have to be quite fit to actually do this. I'm about as fit as Pavarotti, and he's dead. <laughs> oh, I see. Imagine Alexi Sale if he was fatter. <laughs> oh, pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. What if... If you came face-to-face with, with an orang pendek, it you can't guarantee it's going to be friendly. It might be territorial and defend its territory. You... You can't guarantee that, can you? you in fact, so I, I read through the list of some of the things that you, you've gone out, and I think you, the risk factor here is, is quite strong, isn't it? Well, the orang pendek, when it sees people, it, it usually, it's usually frightened. It usually tries to get away. It has, it has been known to throw sticks and rocks occasionally, 
And there was one report of it charging at um, one of the native people when he surprised it. But mostly, you know, like orangutans, they'll just try and get out of your way. Mm. Is there deforestation going on in that particular area? Do, do you think that would make it more... Um, come into contact more often with people? Yeah, well, you do get you get coffee plantations. It's not so much logging there, it's coffee plantations and tea plantations. And then you get the villages, they have a cultivated area where they grow their crops, and they have a semi-cultivated area. They call up the garden, which is on the edges of the jungle. And that's where a lot of the sightings take place. I mean, we've been told about them smashing their way into... Um, into sheds to get sugar cane and stuff uh, and um, coming to the edges of villages to steal uh, fruit and vegetables. Right. So they do come close to, to like, habitation, as it were. Yeah, in order to get food. Oh, okay. If they see people, they retreat very quickly. Couldn't you set up... Oh, I see, again, there's a cost factor to this, isn't there? Um, like um, motion trigger cameras or something like that for areas that they're known to raid. We, we have set up um, camera traps. But the thing about camera traps is that they have to be left up a very long time. I mean, we tested them in, in Woodland in Devon. And if we left them up for a couple of weeks, you might get a couple of birds. Mm. Leave them up for... Uh, a couple of months, we got otters, foxes, badgers, deer, woodpecker, uh, a woman having a pee in the woods. <laughs> Lovely. <laughs> All sorts of things. Now, they have to be left for a long time. And generally, our expeditions are only two or three weeks due to, you know, financial constraints. Yeah, yeah I should I should imagine. You say, right, we're sort of like, being to the Iran pendant, I'm, all, I'm intrigued about another place you've been to, like, and you mentioned it, uh, Mongolia and the Mongolian death worm. Uh, what's the story behind this? I mean, I find it, you know, sort of, I think most people will find it a bit sort of, oh, hang on a minute. But, uh, but you've obviously been out to have a look. But what's the story behind the Mongolian death worm? Well, of all the places I have ever been, Mongolia is my favourite. It's utterly alien. It is such a strange and, and bizarre and beautiful place to go to desert. Now, the death worm, uh, they call it Aoi Hoi Hoi uh, in Mongolia, which means intestine worm, because they say it looks like a length of cow's intestine. Uh, and it's supposed to be this creature that burrows its way up out of the, the, the sands of the Gobi in the hottest uh, periods of the year, especially after rainfall. And the nomads go in great fear on it, um, the stories say that it can spit a uh, corrosive yellow saliva, that's like acid, and it can also generate blasts of electricity. And there are stories about camels having trodden on them and being electrocuted. And uh, uh, a geologist with a theodolite shoving, shoving it into a, a sand dune and then sort of convulsing and firing it at the mouth, falling down dead and he's... Uh, colleagues said they saw this red room like creature oozing the way through the sand. Oh, the first came to the attention of the West when a paleontologist in the 1920s called Roy Chapman Andrew went over there. Now he was the basis for Indiana Jones, although Indiana Jones is an archaeologist. Oh. Roy, Roy Chapman Andrews is a paleontologist. He studied fossils. Um, he was going over there to look for fossils of the ancestors of man. And what he found instead was wonderful nests of um, dinosaur eggs, is what, which is what he got famous for. But the Prime Minister of um, Mongolia told him to, to look out for the death worm. And he gave him some goggles and a pair of tweezers to pick it up with if he ever saw it. Uh, but so there, were, there were all these explorers from the 20s that, uh, and the 30s that um, wrote about the death worm. And then Mongolia went into the Soviet period and, and not many people were allowed in. But then in the 90s, it, it re-emerged and uh, other people started to, to look into this. Uh, there's the late Czech cryptozoologist um, Ivan Michele who did several expeditions there. And I went over in, oh, what was it, 2005. And I travelled with my colleagues and the local guides and drivers. We went about a thousand miles through the Gobi Desert, 
uh, speaking to witnesses and staking out the areas where the creature has been seen. We talked to about two dozen witnesses that generally described an animal that's very like a salami or a graft excluder. Uh, it's about the length of your arm, uh, as, as thick as a salami, scaly, brick red in colour, and it's hard to tell the tail from the head. They say that the, the electricity, they call it throwing lightning, they say that that's mythology, it doesn't do that, but they think that it can spit and they're terrified of it. We talked to one man who, when he was a boy in the 1930s, had gone out to tend to his family's camels and goats. He'd seen one, ran and told his parents, and they rounded the animals up, packed up their girth and left the area. They were that frightened. It can throw a whole area into a panic, a death worm sighting. Um, he spoke to another guy who had seen it just a year before we were there, and he had picked one up on the end of a, of a stick, and he was describing this same thing, this weird sausage-shaped creature. Um, you know, and there must have been two dozen witnesses we spoke to. Uh, one guy said it, he saw it emerge from uh, emerge from a hole in the desert and grow a hold of a mouse and eat the mouse. Another guy said he actually killed one by hurling a rock at it. He was so frightened at it. And he said some Russian scientists took the body away. So if that's true, there might be a, a preserved death worm in the basement of some Russian museum. And I don't know what just in a jar of formaldehyde. And <laughs> it's amazing how many times that happened. There was a, um, a natural history museum in uh, New Zealand. They had an enormous stuffed gecko on show, three foot long gecko. And they didn't know what it was because they'd lost the label for it, but it was just in a glass case. And an expert on gecko sees it and has a fit because it's totally unknown to science. And when they studied it, they realised it was the biggest gecko that ever lived. And it probably came from New Zealand, and nobody knows if it's still about or not. The Maoris have this legend of this, this big lizard that lives in the trees. So this the Delcourt giant gecko it was called, and that was found just sitting there in a in a glass case uh -huh. in a museum. <laughs> but with the Mongolian uh, death worm, is there a a a a precedent to it. I mean, are there worms in the desert, sort of generally? You well, know, it's sort of... not a worm. Whatever it is, it's not a worm. It's only called a worm because it's worm-shaped. Yeah. It's probably a reptile, because they describe it as being scaly, and the way it ate the mouse. It sounds like a reptile. Now, there are a group of reptiles called worm lizards, or amphisbanas. Uh, they're a very poorly studied group of reptiles. They're not snakes and they're not lizards, but they're related to both of them. And they're in a little group of their own, and they, they burrow under the earth. And they look, more than anything, they look like uh, they look like big, animated, disembodied willies, more than anything else. <laughs> if you put a worm lizard on, a, on a, uh, a search engine, you'll see they look like big, scaly cocks. <laughs> um, I think that the death worm is an, a very large, undiscovered species of worm lizard. And my second guess is that it would be a, a very large, very thick species of sand boa. Sand boas are um, small constricting snakes that live in, generally in grasslands and deserts. Uh, and they've got that weird sausage shape, a bit like the, uh, the, the worm lizard. Um, but they're not venomous, they're, and they're completely harmless. Like the worm lizard, again, completely harmless. And I think the death worm is probably harmless, and these stories of it spitting venom and stuff are just embellishments. Because that happens all the time with animals. They used to say uh, that the natives used to believe that gorillas would carry off native girls and rape them, and they could tear down branches off trees and fight elephants with them, and all sorts of things. But of course, that doesn't happen. And um, there's a type of sand boa from. Um, Somalia, in Africa, and the local name for it, for it is Apris, they call it the Apris, and they're terrified of it. They think it's so venomous that it doesn't even have to bite you to kill you. If it so much as touch it, the venom will seep out of it and into you and kill you, which is complete nonsense. It's not venomous at all. And yet you go into the desert to try and find these creatures. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
on this one, what what do you think? Do you think it's it's just a lot of folklore surrounding something that's quite normal, um, and it's just a question of catching it? Yeah, I think the death worm is a harmless burrowing reptile, but because it looks bizarre, they attached all these weird stories to it. We talked to a retired army colonel. We stopped in an old military base near the border of China. Once, and it's got a skeleton crew there now. And we, we talked to this old retired colonel. He said he was on a patrol once in the 70s. And he saw what he thought was a, a section of tyre lying in the desert. And as he got closer, he saw it was the death work. And he said it, it, it had it burrowed up from the ground. It was like basking in the sun. And he had dew on its back. And the sunlight was sparkling on this dew. And he thinks that's where the idea of, of the electricity comes from. Mm. Oh, I see. So they might be rare, they're just, but not as deadly as, as their name has been banded around. I don't think they're, they're, they could probably give you a fair old bite, but I don't think they're particularly dangerous. And the goby is so vast. Mm. And we're something, talking about something the length of the human arm that spends most of its time under the sand. You're going to be hard pressed to find one. So, on your exhib- expeditions, is it mainly about collecting the folklore then on this one, rather than actually trying to find it? Because, like you say, it's so difficult. It'd be wonderful to try and find something. It would, wouldn't it? Yeah. Like, like winning the lottery. My, my friend, um, my friend Dave Archer, on his first expedition, which was to the Mark, on his first day in the jungle. I've never seen it. <laughs> Being in the right place. Right place, right time, isn't it? And I bet that was annoying. Well, I was overwhelmed and excited that he had seen it. I would have been a bit jealous. <laughs> <laughs> well, that way, yeah. first time oh, out, yeah. first day, he sees it. Like, like ah. it. I can imagine it being like, you know, the um, years ago there was that picnic, Cadbury's picnic advert with the pandas and the bloke was, or was it a Kit Kat? I don't know, one of those, the bloke trying to watch the pandas yeah. and he had the camera and everything set up and he was waiting there, nothing happened. <laughs> and then he had a break, had a Kit Kat or a chocolate bar of some sort and um, he sat at that and then the, the um, pandas come out and roller skates mm. and dance <laughs> yeah. around. And then when he went back to his camera, they went back in. <laughs> it must feel a fruitless task sometimes, though, when you're out there. Okay, you're experiencing the culture and, and you know, chasing down the story. But um, to actually get your hands on a specimen of either, you know, any of the species that you've gone looking for, um, that's, that's the holy grail of it all, isn't it? It is. It is all the time. Every time we go, we learn a bit more. So it's never fruitless. We always learn more. But to actually film one of these things or to get DNA from one of them. Mm. I mean, most of the things we hunt are too big to catch anyway. You couldn't, I mean, you couldn't, you couldn't capture a 60 foot snake from South America and bring it back to Britain. No, true. True, yeah. <laughs> There's no specimen jar big enough for that, is there? <laughs> yeah, you couldn't really capture a 10 foot eight no. uh, to capture the Yeti and bring it back to Britain. But you would like, like you say, just to capture it, a definitive image yeah. on camera would be. Or to find remains. If you found bones or skulls or something, that would be great. But the yeah. thing about skeletons is that they don't last very long usually, particularly in forest environments, because they get eaten. Things eat them because of the calcium in them. Mm. Uh, uh, eat them, get the calcium out of them. <clears throat> the only reason we know about Gigantopithecus, the giant ape from. Uh, Pleistocene, China and Vietnam is that porcupines dragged their bones into caves to eat them where they got preserved and we got the, the teeth and the jaw bones which is all we've got from Japan mm. which may be the ancestor of the Yeti mm. Yeah, um, moving on to the Yeti uh, have you sort of well, I take it you have sort of been on an expedition to the Himalayas having a look not to the Himalayas, to the Garo Hills in uh, northern India. The Yeti is just found in the Himalayas in Tibet. It's also found in um, parts of uh, uh, India, 
and with very similar things reported from Malaya and in central China, where it's called Yeren. Got lots of different names, uh, where depending on whereabouts you're talking about. In, in where we were in the Garo Hills, it's called Monday Barung, which means the forest man. And uh, we went into the Garo Hills looking for this thing. We found tracks by a forest stream where something had been walking along, and it had been heaving boulders that no man could lift heaving them out of the way and eating freshwater crabs from underneath it. And it left man-like footprints about 12 inches long that sunk into the mud twice the depth of my footprints, and I'm 17 stone. And this sub-adult, an adult will have um, leaf footprints 19, 20 inches long. And we talked to a lot of the hill tribes that have seen this, this creature, and they all described something looking very like a gorilla the thing they liken it to is a gorilla, but walking on its hind legs uh, with long black hair. The yeti isn't white, that's a fallacy. The yeti is generally report, reported to be brown or gingery brown and sometimes black, but hardly ever white. Mm. Um, and uh, one guy we talked to said he was on a hill looking down and he saw this immense figure. And he thought, at first he thought it was a man in a... Um, one piece black overall when he realized it was just way too big and he realized he was looking at this huge ape-like creature and he said it was building a nest and the way he described it was building a nest was rather like the way that gorillas do and uh, several days afterwards he went down to have a look and there were like remains of um fruit and vegetables that had been eating in the nest uh, another guy said he'd seen one in a, a stand of bamboo and it was a female suckling a baby um, even sitting down, she was five feet tall. And um, she was sucking the back of the bamboo. Uh, another guy said he saw one that did a sort of threat display and it roared and, and shook the vegetation, which is very like what gorillas do when they want to intimidate you. Yeah. But that, they were all describing the same animal three metres, ten feet tall, black fur, walking erect, very like a gorilla. And, um, uh... From what you've heard from like descriptions from the uh, the natives, so to speak, uh, do you notice sort of the uh, similarities between them and the known gorilla types? Well, this thing it looks like a gorilla. It, it builds nests in a way that gorillas do, but I'm not saying that it is a gorilla. Mm. Probably more closely related to Gigantopithecus. Than anything else. Right. I was going to say it's 10 feet tall. <laughs> well, it's big, yeah. But you don't think you'd be able to miss that. <laughs> the jungles there in northern India, they go, they stretch from um, where we were in Meghalaya up through Assam, where the local name for the Yeti is uh, Konglen Po, and then into um, Bhutan, where it's called Maigor. Mm hmm. Yeah, because I remember reading that uh, sort of most people obviously think of the Bigfoot, you know, and the sort of like Yeti, but that whole sort of area, I mean, the Far East, he's quite, does have a lot of sort of stories and lore about sort of wild men, doesn't it? Yeah, and what we know from the fossil record now is that there were lots and lots of different species of hominin. Now, a hominin is one of the relatives of the ancestors of man. And these new species of hominin are, are turning up all the time, all over the place. Um, there's a place called Red Deer Cave in China where they've got these, I don't think they've even been given a name yet, but they've got these new uh, recently discovered hominins that are only 10,000 years old. Now, 10,000 years might seem like a long time to you, but in evolutionary terms, it's the blink of an eye. It's yesterday. Yes, because... We've got, we've got the uh, Denisovans that were discovered recently. They're only known from jaws and teeth. They seem to have been related to the Neanderthals, but were bigger uh, and chunkier than Neanderthals. Um, we've got the Homo floresiensis from the Indonesian island of Flores, the little hobbit people. Uh, they were only yeah. about a metre tall. And more recently, 
uh, something very similar has been found on uh, in the Philippines, Homo lutsonensis, a very similar species of these tiny island hominins. Um, and it turned out that these are more closely related to Homo habilis than they are to Homo erectus. Homo erectus is the ancestor of us, and the ancestor of the Neanderthal and the Denisovan. And it, uh, it was thought that they, they were the ancestors of these little hobbit people, Homo turistiensis, Homo lutsonensis. But it turns out that they've got much more in common with uh, a hominin called uh, uh, Homo habilis, which lived in East Africa. Now, we know that Homo erectus left Africa and moved off into Asia and, and colonised most of Asia from there. <coughs> Nobody dreamed the much more primitive Homo habilis, which was much earlier, it died out about 1.9 million years ago. Nobody suspected that this had left Africa and had got descendants on the other side of the world, which begs the question, what else is out there? So what do you make of the, the, the Sasquatch tales from America and the alleged sightings that have been seen over there? Have you done an exhibition over there or... or... Do you not really? Well, no, I've never done a, a, a Sasquatch hunt. Um, because mainly the world and his wife seems to be looking for Sasquatch. And there are much fewer people concentrating on the Asian mm. yeah. creatures. So I like to concentrate on the Asian creatures. Um, now, there was a, uh, a land bridge from Asia to North America during the last ice age. And this wasn't solid ice. This was land and forest. So creatures migrated over. We know that mammoths migrated from Asia into North America. And um, lots of other uh, large animals did as well. Uh, so it's possible that the, the Yeti, if it may be even Gigantopithecus, might have uh, migrated across this land, land bridge and come to, uh, to North America, where it's known as the, as the Sasquatch now. In the same way you get brown bears in Asia, you get brown bears in North America. Mm. Mm, yeah. Is there any footage or anything that you've seen that you thought, that's likely? The patterson Gimlin footage. Ah. The, the female Sasquatch taken in the 60s at Bluff Creek. And I'll tell you why that's not a man in a suit. Reason number one, it's got a big hairy pair of tits. <laughs> sorry, like I was, was going to say I was just thinking that <laughs> carry on, sorry you're thinking of faking a, a Sasquatch a Sasquatch film you get a very tall guy, put him in a gorilla suit why do you suddenly think, I oh, know I'm going to put a big pair of hairy knockers on it <laughs> which is much more expensive anyway now the known species of apes Females don't have large breasts. If you look at a female ape in a zoo, they don't have large breasts in the way that women have large breasts. Now, women have large breasts to counterbalance the large buttocks because they walk erect. Um, the gluteus maximus muscles in your buttocks that help move your legs give human beings these round buttocks, which, again, if you look at an ape's bum in a, in a zoo, they don't have round buttocks. Female chimps will get the, the weird sexual swelling when they're in season, but they don't have round buttocks. And round buttocks, humans have them because they walk erect. Now, women have wider pelvises because of the birth canal. That's why women have larger rounder buttocks than men. And one of the reasons that women have rounded large breasts is to counterbalance the large round buttocks. Now, a hypothetical species like walking ape would need a similar setup because it'd be moving in a similar way. It would have those buttock muscles to help it move erect. So a female would have human-like breasts. Uh, another thing is, when you see it side on, you see it's got a thick brow ridge and then the, the forehead slopes away very acutely. It, it doesn't have a high forehead like a human has. So if that's a guy in a a mass, he's got a very weirdly shaped head. In order to disguise that, and in order to make a human head fit into a mask like that, 
the mask would have to be way too big for the body, so it'd look like a, a sort of weird Mardi Gras head. Mm. So it couldn't fit in that profile anyway. And um, human legs are 20% longer than their arms. But if you look at the length of the arms of the creature in the Patterson Gimlin film, they're only about 5% shorter than the legs. So the arms are a lot longer than human arms. Mm. So people would say, or oh, maybe they're using arm extensions to make the arms look longer. But that would make the forearm look ridiculously, unrealistically long. You can't change where the elbow is. The elbow looks perfectly natural. So all the anatomical things are adding up to this being a real animal and not a guy in a monkey suit. Mm. Interesting. Yeah, because there is a lot of controversy about that particular piece of film, isn't there? Um, you know, it, it is one of those. I, but I suppose if you, you need to know what you're looking at in regards to, you can't just look at it and go, ah, oh, it's fake. You need you would need to know what you know, Richard, you know, because I wouldn't have known that. To me, that just look it's weird, but I don't <laughs> know enough about anatomy to make a judgment on that. Other people have tried to replicate this by getting uh, seven foot plus people and dressing them up in costume and having them walk through the woods and film it and they've never made anything that looks remotely convincing. Yes, I can remember sort of there's been you know, scores of documentaries about the Patterson uh, Gimlin film and as Kerry said, you know, you've had lots of people with sort of filming and sort of the stuff like that. But uh, I believe... Uh, apes and um, they can't actually turn their heads like uh, humans can and in the Patterson Giblin film it, it does what a, sort of like an ape will do it, it turns the whole of its body to look yeah, the whole of its of the body yeah it does do that mm. yeah interesting it is a very interesting piece of footage whatever way you want to look at it um, in fact the whole topic is because again never seen it never been proved it's, it's one of those, isn't it? It, it? It's still yet to be found. On that note, we're actually going to take a quick break. Um, when we come back, we're going to have a, a, yeah, a look at some more fascinating creatures that uh, Mr. Freeman has been on the hunt for. Join us right after this. <laughs> Hello, Harry Price here. If there's nothing me and my friends enjoy more here on the other side, it is to sit back and relax and listen to the Paranormal Concept Show right here on the PAUK Radio Network. Broadcasting a plethora of interesting and informative content for all your paranormal needs. Find them across social media to keep up to date with forthcoming shows and all their other adventures. Hello, is there anybody there? And welcome back to the Paranormal Concept Show, exclusive to the Paranormal UK Radio Network. Now, before the break, we obviously we delved into the deep and dark forests of Sumatra, the deserts of the Gobi Desert. <laughs> we've been sort of like, oh my goodness, we've been sort of like everywhere at the moment. But this isn't the end to, to Richard Freeman's travels. He's also gone to Tasmania to try and find the Tasmanian wolf. Now, this, I believe, was a previously extinct wolf, right? Well, it's not a wolf at all. It's oh. It's a marsupial. It's also called the thylacine. And uh, it's an example of convergent evolution. That's when two organisms that are not at all related, often on opposite sides of the world, uh, will evolve to look like each other because they're filling the same ecological niche. So the Tasmanian wolf, the thylacine, um, is more closely related to the Tasmanian devil and, and uh, the quoll and other flesh-eating marsupials. Uh, it looks like a, a wolf or a dog, though, because it's fulfilling that role in an environment where there are no, or there were no, um, true placental wolves or dogs. It, if you could remember, uh, imagine a, a large dog about the size of an Alsatian with a short, uh, brown coat, uh, light brown coat, and then dark chocolate brown stripes along its rump, and a, a, a long, thick, stiff tail. You'll get an idea of what a Tasmanian wolf looks like. 
Now, they live in New Guinea, Australia, and Tasmania. They were thought to have died out a few thousand years ago on the mainland, uh, possibly due to diseases uh, brought over when uh, Aborigines introduced the dingo. But nobody really knows why they died out on the mainland. But on Tasmania, they were still around because Tasmania was an island. Now, when a white man got over to Tasmania, they proceeded to wipe out all the Tasmanian emus, which were a distinct uh, species uh, adapted for uh, colder, wetter environment. <coughs> they wiped out the, the Tasmanian Aborigines. They hunted them like rabbits. They, just went, they went, literally went beating for them and shot them when they came out of the bushes. And... They put a bounty on the head of the Tasmanian wolf because they blamed it for killing sheep because there were a lot of sheep farms down there. Um, and about 3,000 of them were killed uh, over a period of around 70 years or so. And um, they were thought to have died out in the 1930s. There was a population crash around 1905 which they never seem to recover from. Um, there were a number of them in zoos around the world, but they never tried to breed them. The last one was supposedly uh, in Hobart Zoo in Tasmania, and it died in 1936 or 37, I can't remember which one. But since that time, there have been over 5,000 sightings, sorry, 4,000 sightings, uh, including one by a, uh, a zoologist called Hans Nardin, we saw one of these animals in the early 80s from a distance of only 20 feet. It's been called uh, the healthiest extinct animal you'll ever see. Its continued existence has also been <coughs> predicted by a computer program. There was uh, a scientist called Professor Henry Nix, and he uh, developed a computer program called BioClim. And what BioClim did was match up what was known about a certain area and what was known about an animal and then it would predict where in this particular geologic geographic range the animal should be found so you program everything you know about the animal's habits into into this program everything about a certain a certain uh, geographic range then it would match them all say if you wanted to find white rhinos in Botswana it would match up the best places to look for white rhinos in Botswana mm. He decided to try and, as an experiment, do it for the Tasmanian wolf. And he found out that there was a 98% matchup between where the BioClim program predicted thylacines should be in Tasmania if they were still around and where people were reporting them from. So he was convinced from that moment that the thylacine was still a living animal. Mm. Yeah, I sort of, I used to live in Australia for a while and uh, certainly sort of, uh, I lived on the mainland, but uh, there were actual stories sort of coming out from the mainland as well, but uh, would you put any sort of credit in those? Not impossible, not impossible. Mm. Uh, <clears throat> the sequences of film that I've, been, I've, I've seen from the mainland seem, seem to show foxes with manes. Yeah. Thylacine. But foxes never got a foothold in Tasmania. There's, there's been a couple of individuals that got off of ferries, stowed away on ferries and got off, but there was never a population of them. Right. This thing hunts and kills differently to <coughs> dogs and foxes anyway. It favours the highly vasculated organs, that are the heart, the lungs, the liver and stuff. And uh, it will it will kill an animal. It will often bite away the snout of a, uh, a prey animal because there's, there's a lot of blood in the snout. Yeah. It will burrow into the, the, the body and get all the organs. So it's different, a very different way of killing the dog. And I, I spoke to um, an old logger out there, and he had he had seen one back in the fifties, and his son had seen one just a year before. Uh, I, I spoke to um, a government 
licensed shooter who goes out and keeps down a feral cat, because cats are a bloody plague. Yeah, they are a problem, yeah. Pain in the arse. And um, they're responsible for the extinction of a lot of small mammals and birds. But like in, in on New Zealand, there was a little island between the two main islands called Stevenson's Island, and it had a tiny species of flightless wren on it that ran around like a, a mouse on the floor. And in Victorian times, they opened a lighthouse. The lighthouse keeper had a cat, and that cat killed every single wren on that island. So it's responsible for the extinction of an entire species. Yeah. There are very few animals I dislike. Chimpanzees are one of them, and domestic cats are the other. <laughs> Whilst down in Australia way, uh, did you ever sort of go and sort of look into Yowie reports, or what are your thoughts on the Yowie? I, I, was, I, was on, I was on Tasmania, I was only very briefly on the, the mainland at airports on route to Tasmania. Oh, right. And the point I was going to make, this guy that went out shooting these feral cats, he spent hours and hours in the bush every day, and he saw the fire sign twice. Mm. So, right. So it is there, it's just a question of catch, not catching it, but capturing the, you know, it definitively now. Yeah. Is it, aren't we humans? Aren't we a horrible species, really? Yeah. yeah. You know, we hunted it to a near one extinction. It's just tragic. The thing about it is, there's lots of iconic extinct animals. Think about the dodo. Yeah. Yeah. Passenger pigeon and the great orc and Stella's sea cow. Nobody, nobody reports seeing dodos or great orcs or passenger pigeons, but every year people report seeing thylacines. Mm. Yeah, has to be something in it. Just on that point, what's your um, opinion, really, on taking um, possible DNA from, say, a dodo and then maybe recreating, you know, recreating the species? The tragedy of the dodo is. There was only ever one stuffed specimen. And that that started to go mouldy and they threw it away. Oh. They always got a fragment of typical a piece of bone and a head and a claw. Now, if yeah. they taking dodos into captivity, like they did with peacocks, and they brought peacocks from India, and they're in on every country or state going now, they've got peacocks. Mm. Dodos could have been the same. Yeah. With dodos. Yeah, it's so you you know the 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 point of taking DNA and and, and home growing one as it were, um, it it's an inaccurate science then. Well, you couldn't do it with a dodo because I don't think there's enough material to get it from. With thylacines, you've got whole specimens, um, you know, preserved in in alcohol and stuff. Yeah. Now, having said that, uh, the entire genome of the Denisovans, which we mentioned earlier, they have been extracted from one toe bone and one finger bone. The entire right. genome of, of the Neanderthals has been matched as well now. Oh. Maybe it would be possible. It's a type of pigeon. The dodo is a type of pigeon. It's a giant flightless pigeon. Its closest living relative is a bird called the toothbill pigeon. <laughs> So we might be able to like do a Jurassic Parky and fit parts of that DNA within. Maybe in the future, as it stands now, it's not advanced enough. There is another project for an animal called the quagga. The quagga was a type of zebra that lived in South Africa, and it uh, <coughs> and it was um, different to other zebras because it was only partially striped. It's only half. Right, only half the animal had stripes on it. Um, and they were wiped out. The last one died at London Zoo when it it was a male and it tripped over and broke its leg and had to be shot. That was the last one. Uh, <coughs> but looking at the DNA from preserved specimens, it, it found out they found out it wasn't an individual species, it was a subspecies. It was a subspecies of the, the plain zebra. So there is as we speak, there is, and it's been going on now for about 20 years, there's a, <clears throat> something called the Quagga Project, when they're getting plain zebras and breeding them for the characteristics of 
the quagga, which are, are much less striped and uh, uh, an ability to live in a much more arid environment. So whether anything will come of that, I don't know. Mm. <coughs> oh, it's a shame, it's a shame, and we are horrible creatures as humans. We do sort of try and... Oh, we do do this, don't we? Let's bring you closer to home now, because you haven't just gone to far stretched reaches of the world. You've done a lot of exploration in the UK as well, haven't you? Well, I've been to several lakes looking for lake monsters. Uh, Loch Ness, Loch Marat, and a place in Lancashire called uh, Martin's Mere, where I actually saw the creature. You saw it? Yes, I saw the monster of Martin Mere. And was it a monster? It was a monster catfish. It was a Wells catfish. Now, Martin Mere, we heard these stories about uh, swans and geese being attacked by something that would pull them under water, so it had to be big and powerful, whatever it was, uh, much bigger than a pike. So we, we rang up and talked to a guy called Pat Dushnevsky, who was uh, the, the, the sort of warden of the place, and he said, yeah, there's something big in that lake. It's the size of a sofa. I've seen it swimming around. So, yeah, I'll have a look for it. So we got up to uh, Ormskirk and to Martin Mere. And when I saw Martin Mere, my heart just sunk because it was like maybe two acres, not very deep. And I thought, there's no way a big predator could live here. Martin Mere was once the biggest lake in England. It was an enormous place. It was... In medieval times, it was all drained off to make uh, agricultural land. Mm. And this little puddle of a thing is the last, it's the last remnant of it. And about half an hour after saying that, I was walking around by the edge of the lake, and this thing came up to the surface, thrashing about. And it was a huge catfish, about eight feet long. <coughs> Immense. <coughs> Rubbery. Like a lot of wet PVC texture. <coughs> Do you reckon that was introduced at some point, or well, the Wells catfish is naturally found in in um, Western Russia and Central and Southern Europe? But there was a uh, a Victorian outfit called the Acclimatisation Society, and it was run by this wildly eccentric man called Frank Buckland, who was uh, Queen Victoria's head of fisheries. And the, the Acclimatisation Society tried to acclimatise climatise foreign animals uh, into the British countryside, mainly for hunting purposes. And one of the things that worked was the Wells catfish, which they brought in from Russia and Southern Europe and introduced it. And the biggest one ever found uh, was caught, um, I think it was caught on the, on the, um, the River Volga. And that was uh, 16 feet long. <laughs> Uh, half that big, but it, you know, if you think about it, if you're walking by this lake, you've never heard of a wild catfish. You don't know where a catfish that big in Britain. You're walking along, happily minding your own business, and this huge back breaks the surface. This mm. green, black, shiny skin thing thrashing around in the water. You're going to think it's a monster. True. True. Yeah. I would. <laughs> So let's move on here, the, the famous cryptid here in the UK, uh, Loch Ness. Let's move into the Highlands. Uh, what are your views on uh, what's going on in Loch Ness? Well, Loch Ness and the Loch Ness Monster are probably like the famous lake and most famous monster in the world. Yeah. Go up to Loch Ness, even if you don't believe in the monster, it's somewhere in your subconscious, in the back of your mind. So... If you see undercurrents, which there are a lot of in Loch Ness, pulling debris in the opposite direction of the wind, you're going to think it's a monster. If you see a seal that's coming through the River Ness or the Caledonian Canal, and there's film, alleged film of the Loch Ness monster, which is nothing more than a, a large male grey seal, if you see a seal in Loch Ness, it's going to be the monster. Uh, and because the Loch Ness is very deep and very narrow, boat wakes will hit the side of the lock and then bounce back again. So there'll be a wake that looks like a row of humps, um, you know, half an hour after the boat's gone. So that'll be the monster. Yeah. But 
that doesn't mean there's not an actual monster in Loch Ness. Now, things like plesiosaurs are non-starters. There'd, there'd be more chance of it being Elvis Presley in a rubber suit. That <laughs> <laughs> old Elvis. Because they, they died out 65 million years ago, and they were air breathers. So you'd see them coming to the surface. If you watched the lot for any length of time, you'd see a plesiosaur or any other animal that breathed air surface to, to get air. So all these, all these groups, like the, the Loch Ness Investigation Bureau in the, in the early 70s and late 60s, they were watching the lake, you know, all day long. Mm -hmm. They were able to see them all the time if there were big air-breathing animals there. But that means whatever it is takes its oxygen directly from the water, so it's probably a fish. So there are several candidates um, but for large fish could be behind the Loch Ness Monster reports. Now, in the earlier days, I'm sure some of these were huge sturgeon. And a sturgeon is one of the biggest freshwater fish in the world. Um, the biggest one, the beluga sturgeon, and again, it was caught on the Volga River in 1827. That was 23 feet, <laughs> 23 feet 7 inches. So the, the length of a big crocodile. Yeah. And it would have been as broad as a car. Now imagine something like that swimming around in Loch Ness. There, there's a monster. But the thing about um, sturgeon is, is they're critically endangered now. Because um, they swim up river to spawn in fresh water and in lakes. And in a lot of places they've, had, they've put dams and hydroelectric schemes in that have interfered with their breeding. Um, right. They over-collect the eggs for caviar. So all the eggs get taken, and they're killed for their swim bladder, because the swim bladder is um, it's used in it, well, it used to get used in um, the creation of certain types of beer. The swim bladder was used for, to help ferment beer. Uh, so sturgeon has been hunted right right up to the edge of extinction. They're critically endangered now. So. There's probably not been a sturgeon in Loch Ness in 40 or 50 years. Uh, the Wells catfish could be in there, but it's further north and colder than you usually find them. Although there is a, a picture of a monster in a Scandinavian lake that looks like a giant catfish to me. But a recent um, look at environmental DNA in Loch Ness didn't find any catfish DNA. But what it did find was masses and masses and masses of eel DNA. Now, a European eel lives in fresh water. When it gets ready to breed, because they don't sexually develop, um, Sigmund Freud, the psychologist, before he was a psychologist, he was interested in natural history, and he dissected thousands of eels trying to find sexual organs in them and found none, because nobody knew the breeding system of the, the European eel back then. And basically, they, they have no sex organs until they get to a certain age, and we still don't know what triggers this off and it's it, it, different ages in different parts of the world uh, in some cases eels have been kept in captivity and they've lived to 70 100 and not sexually developed but something triggers them and when they sexually develop they leave fresh water they swim out into the atlantic ocean to the sargasso sea they breathe and, then, and die, and the babies, which are called leptocephalus, they swim back, and there are several theories about that. One theory is that they, they navigate by using magnetic fields or by the moon, and there's another theory that they follow scent trails. But the babies come back to the ancestral waters, and then it all starts again. The breeding cycle starts again. And there's a theory that some eels never, ever sexually develop. They're called eunuch eels because they're sterile, they stay in fresh water, getting older and older and bigger and bigger. And nobody knows exactly how big or how old they get. In 2004, some Canadian tourists at Loch Ness said that they saw an eel in the shallows that was 25 feet long. <coughs> a giant eel is a much better candidate than a plesiosaur for the Loch Ness monster. And quite possibly there could be more than one of them as well, I suppose. 
Well, there could be, but at any one time within any, you know, any given time out of the whole population, only a handful of these mutants would would um, <coughs> occur. And Loch Ness isn't the only lake. There's Loch no. Morar. I've been to Loch Morar as well. Uh, Loch Morar doesn't have a visitor's centre. It doesn't have uh, merchandise on sale about the monster. It doesn't have a tourist industry. There's one hotel that used to be an old hunting lodge, but still the monster is seen there. In 1969, two fishermen collided with a 30-foot-long creature that they said looked like a huge eel uh, in the water. Um, mm. Simpson and McDonald, that they were called, and the creature was at least as long as their boat, and it accidentally bumped into the boat and, and terrified them. Uh, I was told by the landlady of um, the uh, hotel I was staying at while I was up there, uh, she said uh, that most of the stories around Loch Morar never leave the village. Unlike the Loch Ness Monster, if someone sees that, it's all over the newspapers. In Loch Morar, uh, it never leaves the village. She said that a few years before, a couple of lads from Yorkshire were up on a um, fishing holiday. And they were out in this boat and uh, they saw what they thought was a, a dead tree in the water until they realised it was moving towards them under its own volition. And they said, well, it drew alongside the boat, then it sort of arched up and dived under the boat. And they said it was this huge, browny grey elongate thing about 30 feet long. <laughs> wow. Yeah. <laughs> made it in record time back to the, the shore. Yeah, yeah. they did. Packed up, packed up and went home. <laughs> so it's definitely not a demon raised by Alistair Crowley at Bolskine House then. Oh, that's a whole different story. <laughs> With Loch Ness, there's probably a lot of different stuff going on. But the, the physical Loch Ness monster is almost certainly an eel. The, the whole Alistair Crowley story, that's, that's something for a different time because it, it's so complicated and it's got so much in it um there's, there's one one time that was a there's a guy called the reverend dr donald orman actually exercised Loch Ness mm. because there's a supernatural creature there and the uh the writer um fw holiday who wrote the dragon and the disc and the great form of Loch Ness and goblin universe he thought that lake monsters and sea serpents were literal evil supernatural creatures that were literally evil dragons but that's that's a story for another time because it's I, I could talk with it and I do a whole other talk on that. All oh, right, okay. <laughs> <laughs> the lakes in in, in Scotland, uh, Loch Shiel, uh, Loch Lochy that have these monsters. And if you go to Ireland, it's full of them. Ireland is full of them. And uh, <clears throat> there was one time they call them piasts over there, <clears throat> or horse eels. And so they say that these, these huge eels, yards and yards long, that are seen in, in many, many lakes. Um, there was one seen by a, in the 50s by a librarian called um, Georgina Carberry, and several of her friends were on a fishing trip. It scared her so badly, this was about 30 feet long, had the jaws like a shark on it. It scared them so much that they... they they had nightmares for weeks afterwards and they would never, ever go back to the lake. And she only came back years later, but we wouldn't visit after dark. She was only going to go in the daytime. <laughs> the story in, in Victorian times, uh, one of them got stuck in a culvert. Because eels can crawl across land for miles and miles. And one of these things got stuck in a culvert, this great eel. And um, a local blacksmith made a huge harpoon to kill it with because they, the locals were so scared of it. But then there was a flood, and the flood washed it out of, of, of the pool bed. And a more recent story was um, of a, uh, a house, uh, a large stately home. Now, what was it called? Oh, um, oh darn, I've got my name of the bloody house now. Drewston, <laughs> uh, that's it. I knew I'd it. Drewston House. It's this large house. It's now uh, a missionary centre. It used to be owned by a family called the McVeighs. And in about 1908, uh, Major McVeigh, who had been on holiday, sorry, who had been um, in India, serving in India, come back on holiday to, to his home in Ireland, to Drewston House. 
and there were two big lakes by Drewston House, and local people always insisted that there were monsters in there, and they wouldn't go anywhere near them. Now, the shepherd had been having trouble with dogs killing the sheep, so he put some poison out and killed these two dogs. And the two dogs were left beside the lake, and they were going to clear them up in the morning, get rid of them, bury them in the morning. When they went down to the lake in the morning, Major McVeigh said the dogs were gone, and there were two huge dead eels. There. One of them was 10 feet long, and the other one was 12 feet long. Uh, they were so impressed by the size of these eels, because they died from eating the dead dogs and ingesting the poison, they took them up to Drewston House, and uh, they hung them up by the, the pillars uh, on the, the steps up to the house and had the family and all the servants around to show the size of them. And it was photographed. And they had this photograph framed. And if anybody disbelieved the major, he would show them this photograph. And he was showing people in pubs right up into the 1950s. Now, what happened to the photograph, nobody knows. Just the McVeigh's emigrated to Australia. And I've been going through... Uh, expat Irish immigration groups, you know, expat groups from Ireland that are now in, in Australia, asking if anyone has heard this story, anybody knows, and, and nobody can throw any light on it. I, I've um, written to the guy in charge of the, the missionary centre now, which is what the tradition house is. Says, I've heard the story, but I've never seen the picture. I don't know what... what um, happened to the photograph. I've written to local newspapers, uh, local museums, and not got any response from them. So somewhere in the world, one may have this picture, probably in their attic or in a drawer somewhere, and they don't know the scientific importance of it. Wow. I think that certainly sounds interesting, yeah. There could be a photo out there. Yeah. There could be a photo out there. How amazing if that turned up. (laughs) Things like this. Evidence seemed to slip through our fingers. In 2018, there was a really good documentary called Lost Kingdom of the Yeti. And it was, it concerned a, uh, a guy called Mark Evans, who's a vet, going to the Himalayas, he's going to Bhutan to look for the Yeti, talk to witnesses and so forth. And he got a French geneticist with him called uh, Dr. Uh, Eva Bellamain. And they took samples from a pool up in the Bhutanese mountains. And they were looking for eDNA, that's environmental DNA. And that's a, a fairly new technology where we can look at cells that have sloughed off an animal as it moves through the environment and identify what animals have been around. So you could identify what has been drinking from this lake by isolating the cells that have dropped off the animal that was in the lake, if you see what I mean. Yeah. And they found a very rare species of mountain sheep they didn't know was there. That, that had been drinking from, from the, this lake. They also found the eDNA of a primate. And they said that this primate shared 98% of its DNA with humans. So it was as closely related to human beings as chimpanzee is. Now, there's nothing in Bhutan like that, except the Yeti. There's no <laughs> species like that. So um, I tried to get in touch with this vet. He never wrote back to me. So I tried to track down the geneticist. And I found her and wrote to her. And she was a very nice lady, Dr. Eva Bellamy. And she wrote back to me saying, uh, I haven't got the samples. Um, the company I used to work for, which was called SpyGen, which sounds like something out of James Bond movie. <laughs> <laughs> this genetics company in France. They had still got it. She said, I couldn't do any more work on it because I couldn't afford to. Um, I don't work there anymore. So if they've still got it, they're the people to ask. So I got a, a French cryptozoologist um, I know uh, um, called uh, a French cryptozoologist um, uh, called Christopher that I know. And uh, he wrote a letter to them saying, you know, have you still got this, these samples? If so, we would like to do further work on them. We've got people in Copenhagen who can do genetic work on them. This could be very, very important. But Christopher Killian, who's Christopher Killian, his name was. And uh, they wrote back saying, well, we can't give you these, this sample because it's not ours to give. 
it doesn't belong to us. Uh, he wrote back again saying, um, well, who does it belong to? So if you tell me who it belongs to, I can write directly to them, you know, to see if we can have these samples to carry on work on this, because this could be a huge discovery. They wrote back saying, oh, we've destroyed them. Oh. Uh, right. This is a common theme. Why would they do that? But surely they realised the potential there for a massive scientific experiment. They, they kept it on a shelf for two years and then threw it away. Oh. Frustrating. And, and another thing, um, <coughs> there was um, a British geneticist called Professor Brian Sykes, uh, who I had the pleasure of, of working with. It. Um, he once again came down and spoke at our um, convention, um, the Weird Weekend. And when we went to Russia to look for the, the Russian wild man, he, he was very interested in any samples we got. Because he was running this uh, project where he was asking for samples from mysterious primates. And he was going to try and look at the hair samples and see if any of them were, were from some unknown primate. And he perfected this new way of isolating DNA so he could, he could basically get rid of all the red herrings and tell you what this uh, DNA was from, from hair. And all of the samples he got turned out to be from things like bears or wolves or horses or dogs. They were all red herrings. Uh, but he got some teeth from a skull. Now, this skull belonged to a man called Quit, who lived in a village in what is now Georgia, in the Western Caucasus. And he died in about 1953. He was supposed to be a hybrid between a human being and an Almasty, one of the <coughs> um, Russian wild men. The story goes that in 1850, a female Almasty was captured, lassoed and captured in a forest brought to a farm and she was supposed to be about six foot nine big broad nose thin lips powerful jaws long reddish hair black skin <coughs> long drooping breasts and she was wild and savage at first but very quickly tamed down and they kept her in a stockade in on the grounds of this farm because if they took her inside it'd be too hot for her and she'd sweat profusely uh, she never learned to speak, but she would do menial tasks around the farm because she was very strong and she could lift, you know, great bales of hay and sacks of flour and stuff. And she would crack nuts with her teeth and immense big, powerful teeth and jaws. And she was very fond of liquor, though. If she got hold of her alcohol, she'd just drink and drink and drink until she passed out. In that condition, several of the local men from the village raped her and she ended up having hybrid children and the first couple she took down to the river to try and wash and the shot killed them so the subsequent ones were taken away and raised by people in the village now they looked very human but they were immensely strong they had darker skin than the local people and they were hugely strong um that it said that one of zayna's children could bite the, the back of a chair with someone lifting, someone sitting on it, and lift them up with just with the power of their jaws alone. And Zaina died in the 1890s, but her youngest son quit, didn't die until 1953. And uh, Russian researchers found his grave and got a hold of his skull. And this was in the Darwin Museum in Moscow for seven years. And that was where uh, that was where the uh, Snowman Commission was based that I mentioned earlier. Now uh, the skull looked fairly human. It had a bit of a brow ridge, but nothing massive. So the jaws and teeth were quite large. And then it ended up being brought by a guy called Igor Burtsev, who's a Russian cryptozoologist, and he donated a couple of teeth for this project, looking at. at mystery primate DNA. Now, he looked at the, uh, the Professor Brian Sykes looked at the mit mitochondrial DNA, that's DNA passed down from the female side. Mitochondria are little organelles within cells and their job is releasing energy. 
and yet inherit these from the mother's side. Uh, he found that they were sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, he did some more work and found that they were not human. Not human. They were some other form of hominin. And he was, I had a phone conversation with him about this. And if you read his book, Nature of the Beast, um, in, the, in the epilogue, he writes all about this. <coughs> he reckons that Zaina and the Almasti, the Almastis in general, are some form of unknown hominin, both relative of the ancestors of man. But they probably arose in West Africa, migrated out of Africa at least 50,000 years ago, and he thinks they're probably still around in the Caucasus Mountains. And the last I heard from him, he said he was working with another geneticist uh, on this DNA. And he described it as being like fa fragments of faded ph photograph. He's working on the, the DNA from this, this guy's teeth, which are pointing to his mother being not homo sapien, being something completely different. And then I didn't hear from him in ages, and I wrote several of um, emails to him, never got a reply. It, it turns out he just died of cancer. So obviously he was struggling with cancer and now he's, he's passed away. So whether anybody else is going to carry on this work, I don't know. It could be another dead end because the, the scientist working on it is now dead. It's almost like the scientific community are just like <laughs> shooting themselves in the foot in this area, really. They've got a blind spot for this. Yeah. In Victorian times, <clears throat> it was all about exploration and finding things, and now it's all about being scared of what your peers will think of you. If you yeah. appear to be uh, interested in anything slightly strange, then you might get ostracised by your peers. I mean, a, a good example of it from France again was a guy called Pierre Denis de Montfort. Now, Pierre Denis de Montfort. In the 18th century, he was one of the most famous biologists in France. He was an expert in mollusks. He wrote loads of books on mollusks and the classification of mollusks. And he worked with the Natural History Museum and the um, and several other uh, scientific bodies in, in France. Um, he worked with the uh, they had a big collection of. Um, plants in the botanical garden he, he, he would uh, collect plants for the from foreign countries for the botanical gardens and he'd, he'd, he'd go as far afield as Egypt uh, on the official expedition from the New Zealand botanical garden and he started to talk to <coughs> whalers from Nantucket who uh, settled in France and some of them said that they'd see huge sticker marks on the side of storm whales Sometimes dying sperm whales would vomit up these huge tentacles. And he spoke to two captains of two ships that said they, they'd been, their ships had actually been attacked by giant squid. And giant squid were utterly unknown at that time. And one of them happened off um, West Africa when the ship was in calm waters. They lowered a couple of guys down on a plank to scrape off um, barnacles. And a giant squid appeared, grabbed one of these guys and pulled him in there. The other guy got away. And then it started to attack the ship and shoot its tentacles up onto the ship. And they had to hack at the tentacles with cutlasses just to drive the beast off. And there was a, a similar story um, from somewhere else as well about somebody being snatched from a, a ship by a giant squid. And he wrote a, a book about the giant squid. And he believed it was what? Was behind the, the Nordic legends of the Kraken. Yeah, yeah, we've done a show on that. Yeah, and then uh, because he, he wrote that, he was completely ostracised. He lost his job. Uh, no one would employ him. <clears throat> he had to eke out a living selling seashells, and he finally died of starvation in a Parisian gutter in 1820. In the 1850s, the first giant squid was caught, and he'd been right all along. <laughs> None of the glory, none of the, uh, <coughs> none of, you know, his work was acknowledged. That was his discovery. He had predicted the giant squid. I call him the prophet of the Kraken. He had written about the giant squid decades before it was found. Yeah. And he was 
regret that he'd become a scientific martyr and ended up dying of starvation because people were too arrogant and ignorant to, to listen to him. How close-minded. Mm. Yeah, certainly. At one time, nobody believed in gorillas. They thought, yeah, hairy monsters from native folklore. And then uh, <coughs> the first mountain gorilla wasn't found until 1902. The, uh, the Lolong gorilla was discovered in the 1840s. But up till then, nobody believed in them. Absolute nonsense, they thought. When the pygmies <coughs> in the jungles of, of Central Africa spoke about an animal that was a cross between a zebra and a giraffe, nobody listened to them. And then finally, they discovered the okapi, a species of short-necked giraffe. It's closest living relative from a fossil record of 15 million years old. Uh, the the Chacoan peccary, a, a pig-like animal from the uh, semi-desert areas of South America. We're not talking the jungle, we're talking about areas of cactus and grassland. It wasn't discovered until the late 70s, and that was only known from the fossil record from the last ice age. So things are turning up all the time. A new species of tapir we discovered a few years ago. We've oh, had the tapir, yeah. which I mentioned earlier, 2017. The Cross River Gorilla, nobody knew about those until recently. So there are mm. big animals out there that are being discovered still to this day. That So all but these other... Oh, other uh, sorry. Science doesn't want to know. Mainstream science doesn't want to know. It's, oh, this is nonsense. Cryptozoologists are all, are all idiots that believe in... <clears throat> any silly story that comes along. It's like they're sticking their fingers in their ears and going, no, 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 we can't hear you. <laughs> but they're soon quick to get involved if you do discover something, yeah. no doubt. Oh, they, they'd want to try and take that away from you then. They'd say, oh, yeah, well, we suspected it was right all along. <laughs> <laughs> that would be the first thing they did. You've got to realise that it takes time and money to discover these things. But the snow leopard... Uh, we know it existed, but nobody had got it on film in the wild until the 1970s. It was something like six or seven years in the Himalayas looking for it before they got it on film. Mm. Wow. That was that was well-financed expeditions that were going over there for years on end. We go to places for, um, you know, two or three weeks. So do you have, like, another job, then, to help finance yourselves? Well, originally, I did this full-time, <coughs> well, as much as you can, and I made money from writing magazine articles and books. I still write books now. I've, I've written eight books, and, and I've, I still lecture. But back then, I was writing for a lot of different magazines, a lot of different paranormal magazines, most of which have now folded, mm. and the ones that didn't fold are paying a lot less. Um, I write for 14 times on and off. And the first big article I wrote for 14 times, I got £1,000 for. The last big article I wrote for 14 times, I got £250 for. Gosh. You can't, right. you can't live off that alone. So I, I had to take a mundane job. <laughs> I had to take a muggle job, as we call them. Has the explosion um, been the same in the cryptozoology world as it has in the paranormal field? Um, no. no, it hasn't for some reason. Um, I remember <coughs> being approached about 15 years ago by a researcher who was working on a series called Jane Golding Investigates. And Jane Golding is cracking looking. Yeah, she's gorgeous. Woman, who's married to um, what's his name? Jonathan uh, Ross, isn't it? And she'd done a series about the paranormal, and she, they were going to do a second one. They, they wanted more scientifically based, and they wanted to do cryptozoology, but <clears throat> they didn't have a huge budget, so they had, it's got to be Britain or Europe. <clears throat> so I, I told them my idea about lake monsters being huge eels and what you could do attract these things is <clears throat> get some boys and underneath them have hessian sacks full of uh, fish meal or dried blood or 
but anything smelly, fish oil, because eels have got fantastic sense of smell. And if these things are in there, and they're as big as they say, you'll see them come up, grab the sacks, and then pull the buoy underwater. And there shouldn't be anything known to science in these lakes, big enough and strong enough to do that. So if you get that, you know there's a big animal there. And also, you might be able to film it by getting close to it. And this researcher said, that's fantastic. I, I've, I've never thought of that. That's absolutely brilliant. That's wonderful. That'll make a great show. We'll get back to you in about a fortnight on that. He got back to us and said, oh, the producer doesn't want to do it. It's, he says it's too real. It's too much like natural history. It's not <laughs> about not your name or, yeah. or healing crystals. load of fucking shit. <laughs> <laughs> had people we've had people say oh oh we'll we'll make a documentary we'll finance you to do to do a, a trip as long as you can guarantee we'll find the animal <laughs> you can't guarantee anything you can't it's guarantee. the same as saying we're going to go on a ghost hunt but guarantee a ghost yeah and then another time another time um some researcher from the bbc said he wanted to come along on an expedition and film it and make a documentary but he wasn't going to pay us anything Nice. Yeah. I mean, I, these days, I wouldn't work with the BBC anyway because of, of what they did to Doctor Who and how they constantly kiss the arse of the Tory party. I wouldn't have anything to do with them. They're a bunch of vermin. They used to be brilliant in the 60s and 70s, and now they're, they might be sick. Okay, so let's get off that topic. <laughs> <laughs> so, what's next for you? I mean, I know it's been an incredibly difficult year. Um, all round for anything um, but when we do finally be able to to start living our lives what's what's next for you i was going to go back to tajikistan <clears throat> last year we were in tajikistan looking for a, a relic hominin called the ghoul g-u-l and we spoke to a lot of people that had seen it um this is back in 2018 when i got the terrible dysentery um <clears throat> including the biology teacher that i got attacked by one of them but we also heard stories about the Caspian tiger. <clears throat> the Caspian tiger was a race of tiger that was thought to have been hinted to extinction in the 60s. Yeah. So we talked to loads of people that had seen them. Hunters who had shot um, wild goat and the tiger had come and grabbed the, the dead goat. Uh, farmers that had, had livestock taken. We met two people who had seen females with cubs. We met a Park Ranger had seen one a month before we were there, until he was in a, in a hundred foot of it. And they all said these weren't leopards, they were tigers, they were adamant. We must have met about a dozen tiger women that had seen these things from the 90s right up to 2018. And when I got back to Britain, I wrote up all this information on the Caspian tiger, and I sent it to every single tiger conservation group I could think of, or I could find online. And the silence was deafening. One of them wrote back saying, this is very interesting that we only deal with the Siberian tiger. No reason bothered to answer, which is insane. And we were going to go back there and try and find the Caspian tiger, but that got sunk. Um, I'm hoping in August to get back out to Mongolia with an American film company that's doing a series on cryptozoology. And they want to do a... Uh, I return to the Gobi Desert and I uh, search for the death worm. So, fingers crossed on that. <coughs> Most definitely. So, is there any, um, is there any animal or you know a crypto animal that you haven't looked into yet that is tantalising you? Yes, the Japanese wolf. Japanese wolf was a. Uh, a real wolf, it wasn't like that, it wasn't a marsupial, it was a wolf, it was a real wolf, it was something called a dwarf wolf, it was the smallest of all the wolves, and um, that was thought to have been hunted into extinction in about 1917. But as with the Tasmanian wolf, there's been lots of sightings of it, and there was even a photograph taken by a school teacher a, a few years ago of one of these creatures. They've got very distinctive markings. So the Japanese wolf might still be around. And then there are lakes in Siberia. Um, there's a place called Lake Chani in southern Siberia, which is a big lake. It's about 53 miles long by 53 miles wide, but it's not very deep. But within the past 
15 years, 19 people have been killed and eaten by something that lives in that lake. And witnesses say that it's about 30 feet long, it rams boats, strips boats over, grabs people and eats them. Uh, there's one story about um, an ex-soldier fishing from a boat and his grandparents were watching him from the, the shore and this creature, whatever it was, ran the boat, he fell into the water, it grabbed him, never seen again. Another guy was out fishing on a boat with his friend. The creature flipped the boat, grabbed his friend, he made it to shore, never saw his friend again. And they've asked, the people around this lake have asked for um, an official government investigation, and the government said, oh, people are just getting drunk on vodka, falling and drowning. It's the sort of drowning that chews you up and spits bits out and they get washed. Yes, that sort and of drowning. Fingers killed. It's, that's like the, the plot to a horror film, and nobody has gone to investigate it. I've been trying to get film companies interested, and nobody wants to. Nobody, nobody's listening. Nobody wants to listen. They just want to make more reality television. <laughs> yes, unfortunately, that does seem to be the beast that's out there at the moment. The reality TV, isn't it? It. it I don't know how far we've come away from that. We, we will get back to it, I'm sure. Two other lakes in Siberia, in northern Siberia, called Lake Labanika and Lake Barota, and they've got similar stories. Uh, <clears throat> the nomads, because there's no settlement around these other lakes, they're, they're further, further out, but nomads hunt there, and they say there's something in Lake Labanika that flips rafts over and grabs people. And they've had their dogs chase deer into the water and this thing has grabbed the deer and pulled it under. And I've seen this huge creature with a wide mouth and a <coughs> great big back. And that's the same in, in um, Lake Barota as well. They, in the, the 60s, the Soviet government um, sent a group there to study the lake. And they said that if they saw this thing come up out of the water and another time they were on a a dead tree that stuck out into the into the lake, and they were out on this, and they, this thing appeared and seemed to be stalking them, getting closer and closer, slowly to where they were on this on this dead tree. But and once again, nobody's gone back and done a proper investigation. I mean, if you think about that, those three lakes, you could make a great TV show or even a series going to look for killer lake monsters that have actually killed and eaten people. <laughs> <laughs> But what my question goes back to, you're putting yourself in the firing line for one of those creatures <laughs> to eat you. Why would you do that? Uh, scientific endeavour. <laughs> yes. I say, I've never been afraid of any of the creatures that I've hunted, I've searched for. There was one time I was, when I was in Russia, we were staking out this old farmhouse, old abandoned farmhouse. It was abandoned in 1973. <coughs> and... Um, a sort of L-shaped veranda around it and three rooms. Um, many people had seen the Almasty hanging around this place. Uh, one of the guys that was with us, uh, a uh, Ukrainian archaeologist called Anatoly Serendenko, had seen a creature around there. And um, Greg, another guy, uh, biologist Gregory Panchenko, I mentioned earlier, he had seen uh, an Almasty in a different, on a different farm in an old barn. But they, they approach human um, human habitation searching for food. And there's a story there that a bunch of, about eight years before, there was a bunch of shepherds just sitting on the veranda one evening. And the door at the end of the veranda opened, and a, a seven-foot almasty walked onto the veranda, walked along the veranda, got one of the men, just moved him out of the way, walked to the end of the veranda, jumped off and disappeared into the forest. So we staked this place out, we put camera traps up, and we put out meat and fruit and honey uh, to attract anything in, and, and then we staked it out. And about 10 o'clock at night, I heard a twittering noise like a bird. Now, Gregory Panchenko, the guy who saw an owl masky in an old bar, he said it was making a twittering noise like a bird. Um, it was entertaining itself by playing around with the, the mane of an old mare that was um, tied up in his barn. And he was hiding in the, in the straw watching it. And uh, another witness we talked to, an old lady who'd seen one back in the 1940s, said it was making this weird twittering noise like a bird. 
So I heard a twittering noise and a camera trap goes off. My leafy camera flashes because I thought, bloody hell, could that be what I think it is? And then nothing happened for hours and hours. And about two o'clock in the morning, it got quite cold. So we went inside one of the rooms. We were warming ourselves around this old stove. They've got this old fashioned range in there. And one of my mates, Dave Archer, he was the guy that saw the orange pen back. He falls asleep on this manky old mattress. And um, oh, and there was this other cryptozoologist uh, uh, called Adam Davis. And we're sitting there, warming our hands around this stove. And the door, which is about, it's knocking seven foot, this door, and sit into this room, is slightly ajar, and it leads out onto the veranda, and there's moonlight and starlight coming in. And then from outside, you hear a deep guttural vocalisation. And I said to him, well, you hear that? I said, yeah. And something walked along the veranda. Whatever that something was, was on two legs, and went past the door. It blocked off the, the, front, the, the starlight and the moonlight to a height of seven foot plus. So something on two legs that was at least seven feet tall walked along that veranda. And I said to him, it's out there, it's on the veranda. And we grabbed our digital cameras, like rushing out, but whatever it was had disappeared. And we were all down, in silence. In the morning, we, tracked, we checked all the camera traps, all we got was vegetation moving about. Was that an owl mass thing? Uh, no, it wasn't a bear, because you know, bears very rarely walk on their hind legs, and it would have made a lot more noise. It was too big for a man. What was it? Yeah. Oh, that tantalising <laughs> tidbit right at the end of the show there. My goodness, the experiences you've had and the life experience, oh, my goodness, I, it's just fascinating listening to your stories, um, and it's amazing that you're filling a passion that you've obviously got for this topic and these creatures that are clearly something is going on out there, isn't it? it it's just fascinating. Mm. Guys, what an amazing show. Uh, that was great. We, we didn't even get uh, Megalodon. <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> Perhaps well, another day for that. Maybe but, another no. day. I'm sure Richard will come back to us and tell us more fantastic <laughs> stories from... Um, his explorations around the world. Richard, thank you so much for joining us. <laughs> that's, that's all right. Yeah, that, that's fine. Yeah, yeah. I've, I've got uh, my new book is out at the minute. It's called Adventures in Cryptozoology, Volume 1. Uh, volume 2 should be out uh, uh, in the autumn, but Volume 1 is out now, Adventures in Cryptozoology, if anybody's interested. And if anybody out there <coughs> has got a shed load of money and wants to... Uh, wants to uh, finance an ex expedition we're always up for that yeah get in touch where can they actually buy your books richard uh you can get my book online uh, at amazon just type in adventures in cryptozoology you could probably order it from most good bookshops and probably most crap bookshops as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, plenty of those around <laughs> and if somebody did want to finance you for an expedition where can they contact you for that well, my um, email is richard at cfz.org.uk and our website is www.cfz.org.uk. Fantastic. And will you promise to come back on another occasion and talk to us more about yeah. it? We didn't talk about the giant anaconda. We didn't talk about contemporary sightings of dragons, which there, there is a surprising amount of. Uh, we barely touched on sea serpents. I know. There's still oh, no. so much we can discuss. So much that and... you have to come back at some point and talk to us more. Yes, well, drop me a line and I'll be happy to come back. Oh, Fantastic. brilliant. And I have to say, if anyone knows where that photograph is that Richard was talking about earlier, you can get in contact with us um, and we can pass any information on as well. Yeah, definitely. In fact, any weird photograph that might be lurking oh, in a well, box, yeah. you know, anything to do with cryptozoology that, you know, you think might be of interest, pass it on and we can get it to the right people who delve into this type of topic. On that note, we have actually come to the end of the show. We're running over now, so we need to say goodbye, guys. Goodbye, guys. Goodbye, guys. And thank you again Bye. to Richard. Goodbye. Bye.